an incredible uh, mind. He also played clarinet, but um, my mom you know, was used to that kind of work ethic. <laughs> and then I came along four years later um, and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't sit, I couldn't read. I, so I, I took the clarinet and um, I did the best I could, you know? I, I've been very lucky to, to be in a profession where you actually could move while you were doing your thing, you know, blowing and fingering. But uh, I, I started studying with my mom and then that didn't go so well. So I, I switched to another instrument. But no, I didn't practice. I was always riding my bicycle outside, uh, hanging out with the boys, playing baseball, stickball, you name it. Any, I only got serious about practice when actually after I won first prize at the music competition. Um, How old were you when, when that happened? 22. Okay. I, you know, I, I practiced for my entrance to, to Juilliard and, and, but my mom, she knew, she, she outsmarted me. She, every night she would say, Frank, let's play together. And of course I enjoyed that, you know, I enjoyed, you know, so we had music that worked with piano and clarinet. And every night we played for one or two hours. That was our way of communicating and being, you know, hanging out together. And I did practice, but it, as a kid, you know, like a young teenager, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, stay in one place. In fact, my first serious teacher who, who played clarinet with the Metropolitan Opera, he threw me out. <laughs> I think I was 13. He said, he said to my mom, he says, I don't want to teach your son anymore. And she says, why not? He says, well, he never practices. He says, Mrs. Cohen, I'm serious about this. And, you know, Frank comes in and I don't want to teach him. So I had to find another teacher. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I eventually did get serious, and I, I mean, I'm known to most of my colleagues as a very, very hard worker. But in the early days, you know, I had no idea I'd be a musician. Do you remember the day, well, not the day, but the time when you really, um, apart from winning the competition, but uh, the time where you really got inspired to put in more effort and, and find your voice, let's say? Yeah, well, you know, I, I fell in love with music, actually, lying under the piano while my mom would practice. Ever since I can remember in childhood, I would just lie there and listen and think, oh, wow, beautiful, beautiful music. And, and so I, I knew I loved music. Um, what I did when I went to school, I, I, I took sort of uh, local auditions for this and for that. And sometimes I usually, I, I usually actually did very well. Um, and then I saw an, uh, a, an international competition my second year at school uh, in Geneva. And I thought, wow, you know, I've never been to Europe. This would be really fun. And I, I saw that there was an organization that was tied up with the United Nations giving grants for young Americans to go to Europe. So I decided to go to the Geneva competition. I went as a, as a contestant. I played 10 minutes. I got eliminated, you know, in the first round. And it was, of course, disappointing, but, I, you know, I went for the fun. And then the next year is when the Munich competition presented itself. And I, that's when I told myself, you know, if I'm going to go again, I'm going to take this seriously. You know, this is, I mean, it's fun to go. It's fun to see people and meet people. But if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. And I, I started to apply myself. I, that, so that was the catalyst. The fact that I did poorly at the first international competition. In the meantime, my cohort from childhood, Garrick Olson, was winning first prize in one competition after another. And I'm seeing he's playing, you know, recitals in Carnegie Hall and here and there. And I thought, you know, this 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 could be fun. <laughs> so um, that's when I really started to apply myself. I think. So what happened after you won the uh, ARD Munich competition? Well, I, uh, at, you know, at the prize winners concert, uh, well, actually there were two first prize winners that year. I was one. And the other one, some of your guests might know, Jesse Norman. Does anybody know Jesse Norman? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, 
you know, she was just a, like me, a young, talented kid, you know, with naivete about the business. And um, after that concert where we both appeared together at the prize winners concert, this elderly man came up to me and said, uh, Frank, you don't know me. My name is so-and-so Winderstein. Uh, and he says, I'd very much like to manage you. I'd like to be your concert agent. And I, I didn't, you know, I never thought of concert agents, but someone, a after we finished our conversation, somebody said, do you know who that was? And I said, uh, well, he says his name's Winderstein. He says, Mr. Winderstein is the biggest manager in Europe. So I was pretty impressed. And I, I went to his office after the, the prize winner's concert happened. And he signed me up on his artist list. And when I went back to New York, I saw his artist list, which had people like <laughs> um, Rostropovich, Sirkin, Isaac Stern, Dietrich Fischer Dieskau, Jean Pierre Rampal, this one, that one, and Frank and Cohen. I thought this this can't be. You know, I was I was nothing. But he started getting me really fabulous dates all over Germany. And so while I was trying to finish Juilliard, which didn't go that well, <laughs> I would be traveling five, six, seven times during the semester to, to Europe. Because my manager, this Mr. Winderstein, was getting me all these wonderful dates. Um, I was probably too young to even realize what, what, what the reality was. You know, I just, it was all, it fell right into my lap. And uh, it was great. I probably should have continued that. <laughs> but what happened is I was also falling in love with this German family and this German girl. And my, my mom and dad were very upset at the prospect of their son living here. And long story short, I just decided after three years, three and a half years of that, to just give it up. Oh. So I came back. I got a job in the States with the Baltimore Symphony which was very, actually very, a real downer after what I had been doing. Um, but I did that for a handful of years, and then I saw there was a, an opening in Cleveland Orchestra. So I auditioned for that. Fortunately, that went well. And when I came here, I, I was realizing how much I missed the solo playing, and I told the management of the Cleveland Orchestra that I'll come, but I want to make this my solo home. And I want to play solos as often as you let, which was usually twice a year, sometimes three times a year, and on tour. And as a result, over my 40-year career, I have soloed with the Cleveland Orchestra more than any other artist in the history of the Cleveland Orchestra. <laughs> you know, I played a lot of you know second grade pieces, but you had solos. First rate pieces too. Um, so I, you know, I gave up my life in Germany and I, I continued here. I, I was able to raise a family, have stability, not travel all the time and, and still perform a soloist you know, a handful of times every year. Frank, I just want to take a, a one moment and share with our um, audience a short clip of Mozart's second movement clarinet concerto played by you. Oh. And then I would like to talk about sound. So if oh. you give me... Is this good? I never listened. <laughs> you never heard it? <laughs> well, you I, go to, it I go to the other room? <laughs> I'll just do it, uh, the first uh, theme, let's say. <laughs> just one second. Sorry, guys. Um, oh, what happened here? Uh, oh. No, one second. No, I, I, I need to, to, something happened to my screen. Just give me a second. But um, my, my, what I wanted to talk about, Frank, is the sound. And what does influence the sound? While I'm looking for this, if you can answer that. What if, well, you know, it's funny because in the, in the day when I was playing all the time, people would say, Oh my God, you have such a beautiful sound and this and that. And 
And even to this day, some of my friends say, I still haven't heard it sound like that. And actually, it perplexes me because what sound on the piano? What sound on any instrument? The sound is what you're doing at the moment. What you're doing is how you're moving the notes. It's not just an abstract, duh. Right. You know? Well, it's an illusion. It's an illusion sound. Well, let me uh, let me show this one clip because uh, that's um, quite oh, interesting. Can you guys see my screen? Can everybody see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. And so on. So I wanted to ask you, I, when I listen to this, it sounds almost that you're not breathing, meaning in a sense that it, there is no breaks in the line. It just sounds, it soars. The legato, the, 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 the beautiful tone. How does one make a sound like that in a clarinet? I'm not sure I know the answer to that. You know, what, the, the gift I have, we, we talked about my, my laziness as a child, but what, I, what I've always had as a musician, whether I practice a lot or not, is I felt music very deeply. I mean, when I hear this now, I always, I, I weep, you know, it's just, it's so beautiful. And, um, you know, Mozart wrote this, he was dying in the last few months of his life. He could barely, he could probably barely st sit there. He wasn't well enough to go to the, the premiere. He had to head back to, to uh, Vienna uh, on his way to Prague for the premiere. He was too ill and he died very shortly after he returned home. Um, so he's crying out for us. And this is music from heaven. And so if, if you start putting air into an instrument, you're thinking that. How do you make the sound? You, you connect your heart to heaven and the people you love and the openness that you want to feel. You know, it's not just... <laughs> and how do you do that? I don't know. You can't explain it. How do you do it on the piano? Well, you know, I find uh, pianists, for example, because I grew up in a household with mother who is an opera singer, father who was a clarinet player, I grew up around people who who were breathing, right? So the, the the sound was always originating from my mom when she teaches voice. You know, she constantly keeps talking about the sound originates in your heart. Yes, that's, that's the, where it starts, right? Yes. And as a pianist, I always felt that 
pianists will greatly benefit from working with singers and working with instruments that that breathe, that have that airflow, right? Yeah. Yes, but you know, I mean, I learn more from singers than clarinet teachers. As I told you, I won this prize. Norman won. Jesse Norman would come. She came on stage before I did perform Wagner and she's like the orchestra's playing and she goes I mean how do you do that on the piano how do you do that on the clarinet I mean you have to figure out how do you get that impression of how do you do it you don't go you know I mean, if you study clarinet with a clarinet teacher, they'll tell you, okay, you breathe in, you firm the diaphragm, and then you go. Well, that, that's not a direct link to heaven. Right. You have to figure out. You know, everyone says, well, I wish I played a, a wind instruments because it's like singing. It's not necessarily like singing. I don't think many oboists, many trumpet players, many clarinetists, many bassoonists that I hear, it feels, it feels like singing, but some do. They've managed to figure out how do you take the air in your lungs? Think, you know, try to imagine from your heart and from your mind and then put this into the air. I mean, it's, it's different. You know, I've had teachers say, take a breath, firm your diaphragm and blow. Steve, you know. <laughs> you know, that's not a direct uh, connection with heaven. Right. This piece is a direct connection with heaven. How do you do it on the piano? I watched a video of my very dear friend, Leon Fleischer, about a month ago. And he says, you know, the thought of what you want to create has to be there, of course, before you even touch the key. And he says, now take, um, take Schnabel or Glenn Gould, they, they played with completely flat fingers, really flat. And why? Because it's the only way they created the sound they wanted. And what was the sound? It had no jab to it. You know, it didn't go, da, it went. <laughs> you know, when you just go like, like that. And if you watch them, you see it. And, and how do you get the sound that you, thank you for the compliment, Milana, you say, it sounds like it's singing. Well, I had an experiment. You know, it's not just blowing. You remember as a young person when you were searching, looking, practicing, do you may, remember that process? Well, I remember, it goes on today. I'm still not happy. I mean, when I pick up the instrument, which I'll probably do after this chat, and I want to play the first note of a Schubert song, and I'll, that's what I'll think about. How do I introduce the air so that it has all this, this in it? Rather than, you know, da, da, da. It's like, and even during one note, if you play, to change the color. And change the, the expression. If, if I play the first note of the Mozart concerto for you, and if I, if I pantomime with my face, and I try to figure out how to do that through the sound, rather than it can be pretty but it's not the same as smiling on that sound how do you do that i don't know i wanted it so i fat figured out a way like schnabel or lengo they try to figure out how to get this beginning that comes out of nowhere. So Frank, apart the fact that you are an amazing performer, you're also a fantastic teacher. I mean, teacher with really great record of students 
getting important positions. The more I learn as a musician, I think I have less luck as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, because no, you get, you get dissatisfied with everything. You know what I mean? And then you talk about that with the student and with students, you have to learn to let things go and be good enough at that moment. Otherwise you drive them crazy. I mean, I drive myself crazy, that's allowed. But if I drive students crazy and they, that's not a good thing. So in my teaching, I've had to learn how to talk about a concept of something and then let them go. And I'll listen to them and I, and I won't necessarily like it, but I, I say to myself, it's fine for now. Let's see how it develops. You know, I might demonstrate something and let them go with that idea or that sound in their head and see what they do with it. If, if it's not in their imagination, you can talk until you're blue in the face and it's, you know, it falls on lost ears. Are you in touch with your students that uh, have graduated and moved on? Yeah, many times, yeah. Um, actually, the ones that are, have been studying this year, I t just call me anytime. Call me in the middle of the night. I'll make time for you. And they're doing it. And I'm very happy with that. Because the interesting thing about teaching online, and tell me, guys, if you can relate to this. You know, the sound is not good when an instrument plays on Zoom. But what's, what's very clear and what's very good is the intention behind it. You know, like if somebody plays a note, -da 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 -da. I said, no, but I want -da -da. And then they try to do that and it still doesn't sound very good, but I hear the intention has changed. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I, I do. I, that's the experience I'm having also with online teaching. Because it's all about intention. You, you, like Fleischer says, you need an idea. And then you sit at the piano and you try to, to get to that idea that you have here. And if it doesn't match, then you figure out how your intention needs to change to get to that idea to sound. And it's, it's working with you know, what you hear when you play and changing that. I mean, this is a process we all have to go through. I mean, without ideas, we're, you know, we shouldn't practice. Now, I heard something very interesting that came from a, a pianist friend of mine, Daniel Trifonov, you all know him. Mm -hmm. He had a very interesting idea. Most of us sit down, like if you're gonna play Dum dum yum You have an idea of how you want that to sound. So you sit down every day you're gonna practice that, trying to go for the same ideal, right? And he he had an idea that this was dangerous and is not freeing. And I think he's very wise. For example, take the Mozart clarinet concerto. The movement you listen to. Very beautiful. And every time you could say, every time I sit down to practice, I try to play it the way I hear it, that way. But he says, I would play it in different ways, completely different. Because if you try to recapture your ideal every day, you get sick of practicing. And you never reach your ideal anyway. So play something completely different. Like, da -de -da 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 -da. and then, -de. and you know, practice it different every day. And then when you actually have to play it, you're improvising. You're playing what you feel at that moment. Rather than replicating every day when you sit down to practice this, this perfect image you have of the piece which is never perfect enough and it drives us crazy. So we practice for five hours trying to get there. No, play differently, very differently. And the next day play very differently from that. Well, it's, it's, it's really brilliant uh, idea because uh, it's, it we, every time we show up in the concert, there's so many circumstances that influence that performance, right? 
So yes. if we are not able to quickly react to whatever it is happening in that moment, yes, you start losing control, you maybe mess up, then you get upset with yourself. Exactly. If, if you're constantly improvising and you're ready for any scenario. Exactly. At that point, it was, it's not a problem. It was a brilliant idea. And I use it every day now. I try not to start off with this perfect imagination of what I have to sound like. And I just start playing, you know, it doesn't matter. And, and yes, I've always actually had the ability to walk out on stage and not be too nervous and try to play from my heart. But for those people where it's not, where it's, where it's not that normal, uh, easy to communicate, um, just, imp you know, play differently every day. And so when you, are in front of an audience, as you say, you're, you're inspired by the moment. And you'll play how it comes out, and it'll be good. But don't we all screw up and make the mistake of, you know, there's a certain way we have to play this? Of course. No, I, I think every person who plays an instrument and has ever tried to perform knows that it's, it's always, you, you never know what's going to happen when you come yeah. out on stage. So... You have to be prepared for multiple case scenarios. <laughs> exactly. And, and, you know, all of my friends who are like world-class musicians that like play piano, some of them, you know, Manny X, Yo-Yo Ma, Vladimir Russia, they play and they're, of course, they're not happy after the concert. Who's happy? You know, but they, they have maybe practiced this exercise in just accepting it, <laughs> improvising at the moment. None of the great artists are happy with the way they perform. Well, that's, yeah, that's I think, uh, something that artists understand, but I, I think audience usually thinks maybe the artists are content, but it's not true because what audience sees and feels is not necessarily what artist feels in, <laughs> at that moment. You know, I went, went with Diana, my daughter, when she was a very young kid, uh, to hear Yo-Yo Ma play the complete Bach cello suites. This is many years ago. And now he's, this is like 35 years later. And we went backstage then. And I said, yo, yo, that was so beautiful. And he said, Frank, I don't have to tell you. <laughs> you know how it feels. I thought it was terrible. I wish I could go out again and do it right now again. And I said, yeah, I know. I understand. So that people who are not performers don't get it. <laughs> you know, as soon as you walk off stage, you want another shot at it. <laughs> or as soon as you retire, you, you'd like to go back to your active career and you know be back in it again, re-recording everything. It's so funny. It's human nature, you know. Before I open it up to the questions, I want to ask one last question. Uh, in your career with Cleveland Orchestra, what is there a moment in time in, in 40 years that you've played with them? that is just stands out like a beacon of light and it was just the most amazing time, the most amazing concert or performance? Um, that's, that's really hard. I mean, there, of course, there are many. Look, you're playing in one of the world's top orchestras. You know, they make beautiful sounds. When you have an inspired conductor, it's really quite special. Um, but I do remember... Um, two instances. I remember going back to Munich where I won that prize and playing the Mozart Concerto with the Cleveland Orchestra in Munich in the same hall where I had won that prize um, with Lauren Mazel conducting. And as soon as I walked out there, I got, I could barely take a breath and play. I remembered that memory of the competition. Um, the other instance I remembered when I did my first solo with the Cleveland Orchestra uh, as soloist out front in Carnegie Hall. I then did another one, playing the Mozart. But the first time I played the Debussy Rhapsody. Um, and my parents uh, were planning to come to the concert. And um, they, whenever I would visit Carnegie Hall with any group, even before I went to Cleveland, I was with the American Symphony with Stokowski. My parents always sat in the same uh, box seat, right? You know, I could just look, almost touch them. And 
when I came to Cleveland, my brother had passed away, so he was gone. And my mom and dad were planning to come to this concert where I played with soloists, featured soloists. And every every weekend when I'd call home, you know, my parents would say, oh, Frank, you're, you're so excited. You're coming like in a month, you're coming in two weeks. Well, the week before I we were to go to New York, my father, oh no, in the meantime, my father in our conversations is talking about my um, inability to memorize very well. And I was planning to play, I told him I was planning to play for music. And he says, Frank, you can't do that. You can't play for music. Please memorize this piece. So at that time I was exercising a lot and I was going jogging every day and I sang through the piece on my jogs and I felt you know, quite confident. So I had decided, okay, I'm gonna play it from memory. Then my father, after he told me that, about five days later, he passes away, suddenly of a heart attack. And, and my, you know, my mom's gonna be there, my brother's gone, my father's gone, she's gonna be sitting up there. And when I walked on a stage, it's like I could, I was weeping, you know, talk, thinking of my family, and all of the beautiful times that we'd spent together in my childhood and music, the, the, you know, the support they had led to me. And somehow I mustered up the strength to actually play this piece from memory and play it in a way that I've never felt before. And you can imagine, it was very, very special. Thank you for sharing this in beautiful memory. Yeah, it was, uh, then after that, I went back to playing <laughs> for music. <laughs> I don't know, you know, at, in the Munich competition, I had to memorize it. But I always felt like I never even knew what the first passage was when I would walk out on stage. Then I saw the likes of Guido and Kramer playing for music, and I thought, if he can do it, I can do it. <laughs> but you always play better without music. There's no question about it. Which is why, Steve, I want to learn how to improvise, because jazzers never use music. <laughs> well, I'll uh, I'll open it up to you guys. So if you have a question, raise your hand and uh, or unmute yourself uh, or both. Or <laughs> Frank, if, uh, as an instructor, is there anything that you would reach back and tell the twenty-year-old Frank Cohen as a, a student, uh, as a piece oh. of advice? Or what would you tell yourself as a student? Well. I might tell myself, well, I would have, I would have actually found a teacher who insisted that I work with, uh, on things that were important because in a way I had no teacher. I was like a wild stallion. You know, the teachers who saw my inability to focus, they just let me do my thing. And it worked out okay. You know, I got a great jobs. I won a big competition, but I think I would have found a teacher who understood me and gave me certain structural things as a clarinetist so I would have a really strong foundation. I never really had that. It's funny to say that at age 74, <laughs> you know, having had, you know, one of the most successful kinds of careers I could have. Um, I would have found a, a really great teacher who would have taught me and insisted on fundamentals, but would have let the wildness in me go. And I don't know if I ever would have found that teacher. Anyway, I don't know if that answers the question or not. Does it? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> oh, that was Greg. It's not too late for you, by the way, too. If you. <laughs> oh, Greg, you, you have Severance Hall as a background. I do. I was waiting for someone to notice. And if you look, I arranged for the piano to be on stage. <laughs> My God. Uh, in case you had the clarinet and, and you and Milana wanted to read music together. I, I, wow, look at that. It's beautiful. <laughs> It's the face, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, advice really to get serious earlier on. Um, because I, I think those people who build fundamental foundation and technique at a very young age, I'm, I'm seeing now that they, they have that for their lives. You know, um, they learn quickly. You know what I mean, uh, Milana? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the Russian school, it's like very strict. That's exactly what I've told of myself as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I see it with, with 
my friends who are right, who have studied with teachers who insist on the highest standard, you get that technique before the age of 12, 13, 14, and uh, it's with you for the rest of your life. When you're sort of messing around like me, uh, every time you have to learn a difficult piece, you, you know, you, I don't know, you're starting from a different place. So I, I would do that differently. You know, I would have taken, what do they call that? The, the drug they give you to concentrate. <laughs> Daniela, you have a question. <laughs> sure, uh, at least two, but I'm gonna try to behave myself. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> we never do that in front of audience, right? <laughs> Well, so first I have to go back to earlier in the conversation, or should I call it the interview, when you were talking about uh, 10 years old and practicing 15 minutes a day. Um, something came to my memory because like Milana, I grew up going to music school and everybody played some instrument. And granted, we got together after the age of 10. So yeah, I guess we had wind players in there, but they used to say, and I think this comes in your defense of why it was 15 minutes a day or why, yeah many reasons. The, is it true? What they used to say is, see, one of the reasons you can take an instrument, a string instrument or a piano at five is because, well, for string instruments, they make those smaller instruments. And, and for wind instruments, I guess we don't have that yet. And the other thing they said is, well, you have to, you can't play a wind instrument if you're missing a tooth. And so, well, when you're five and six years old, then you know, a violinist can go on stage with, oh, you know, something missing there, but that's okay. They can play the violin. A wind player yeah. cannot do that. So supposedly you guys don't start until later. Is that true? Well, I think several things are not true anymore. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you can start on a very small instrument. Um, there is a clarinet. It's in the key of A flat, which is smaller than even the little E flat clarinet. And I know many people in the past also started on that, whose parents were clarinet players. They were smart enough to say, you know what? If my child can begin at the age of four, five, and six, it's much better, and it is. So you can start on a very small instrument. If you lose a tooth, well, you do the best you can. You know, you play double embouchure, which is mm -hmm. like an oboe instead of putting your teeth on the mouthpiece. So those things can be overcome, you know, and, and they, they do. There are classes like in Suzuki clarinet now. Um, and uh, people learn at a, at a very young, young age. I, th I think to, to get a good sound, I mean, on a wind instrument is, um, it takes time. But if you start when you're five, six, seven, you're way ahead of the game. I started at 10, I wasn't serious until I was, you know, eight, 18, 19, 20. And um, so I lost time. Well, I was, I was trying to give you an excuse for probably not having all your teeth at the time, but uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you can do it, you can, you can do it. You um, can do it. And, you can. And, why, and why clarinet when you're, you said your mother was a pianist, uh, your daughter yeah. is a violinist, how did clarinet come? Well, my mom taught me clar uh, piano at a young age. She was a neighborhood piano teacher. And she had all the dysfunctional kids in the neighborhood and, and me. And <laughs> so after two years of that, you know, I, I thought, I don't know, I, I'm not liking it. You know, it created tension between us. And one day I said to my mom, I said, mom, I don't think I want to play piano. But she knew I had fallen in love with music and there was a lot of music in the house. So she said, how about if we visit a music store this afternoon? I said, sure. So we went to the local uh, music store in White Plains, New York. And she tells the salesman, my, my son likes music, but he's, he gave up piano lessons and he, he's trying to find an instrument. So the guy brought out like three or four instruments and put them on the counter. I think one was a trumpet, uh, one was a French horn, one was a flute uh, and a clarinet. Um, it was a metal clarinet, all metal. And um, I tried all of them. And I got a squeak out of the clarinet. So I, I said to my man, I said, okay, I'll try, I'll try that one. You know, it makes a sound. But there was, there was no string instruments on the, on the table? Three or four instruments. No, no string. Oh, no string. string. No, 
No, no string instruments. Oh, no, we're so lucky because see you. Yeah, you would have been the next Heifetz, and so that thank you for making room for us. <laughs> oh, you know, if I had to do it again, I mean, I I never would have stopped piano. Um, I mean, as I said when I opened up this sort of discussion, all of the greatest musicians, with few exceptions, are are mostly pianists. And all the greatest conductors are pianists too, by the way. The greatest conductors are performers. You know, George Sell uh, in Cleveland, he, he was a great composer, he was a great pianist, he was a great conductor. James Levine, um, the guy Yannick in Philadelphia, he's a great pianist. He plays with, you know, the great singers at the Met. Um, I mean, it just gives you the overall view and the harmonic understanding of music. When you're playing a one note instrument, um, you know, you can feel harm harmonies instinctively. And if you study them, you can understand them intellectually. But there's no substitute from having control of all that harmonic language. You know, it's it's a very, very special opportunity. I would have I would have stuck with the piano, although my hands are tiny, and I would have run up against the same problems my, my mom did. When Garrick Olson and I hold our hands, with, so my fingers don't even come up <laughs> to that joint. He has, I think, a twelfth or a third. I mean, I don't, he can stretch an, an octave and a half just about. Stephen has a question. Stephen, you have to yeah. unmute yourself. Yep. No, you're muted. You're muted. Unmute. Unmute. Okay. okay. There you go. Hi, yeah. Stevie. Hi, Frank. Uh, it's not really a question. It's really just uh, thank you. Uh, it's uh, from an amateur clarinetist who struggles. He took it up late. Uh, you are an unusual man, and you are a passionate man. And I have a little brief story to tell about you, if it's okay. The first day we met in Naples, this is an illustration of your passion. We're walking up and down Fifth Avenue. I think we were shopping for something for lunch. <laughs> and... Uh, we were talking about clarinet, and I was saying, oh, you know, I'm struggling, I'm trying to learn jazz, and, you know, etc. And uh, we got back to my car, and you're in the parking garage off Fifth, and your clarinet was in the trunk. And you said, oh, I, I must show you something. And you open, the, you open my, the case, you put the clarinet together, cars are going by, kids are walking with their moms, you know, and you got the clarinet out to show me the glissando on the, uh, on the Rhapsody. And it's just ringing off the pipes in the parking garage. And, and you're, you know, you're, you're just so intensely passionate about the whole thing. I thought, you know, this man is an inspiration. And, and the, the, the several times we've had a chance to sort of stand next to each other and I do my silly thing and you're playing and in that very room you're in, actually. Uh, it's just, it's stuck with me. So I just wanted to say thanks. Oh. Uh, it's meant a lot to me. You're, as Milano said, of course, your tone is just ethereal um, so it's really really great and i appreciate thank it you. thank you so much well i guess you know i feel so lucky to have spent my life in music that i i want to share that love <laughs> yeah. you know it's like a big fan we're a big family aren't we <laughs> i mean you wouldn't be here today if you didn't love milana and music otherwise you'd be you know trying to swim at the beach or something well, it allows you to express things you can't express in words. That's really exactly. what it does. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I, you know, we struggle. Everybody talks, violinists and pianists, they all talk about their instruments, but it's really the soul and the heart that is what it we're is. talking about. It is. It is. Um, Daniela, don't you think, um, I mean, so many people are, are so caught up, you know, I mean, perfection of... Is such a high standard. It's, and today there are so many people who play almost perfectly like a machine. Uh, but still, the people who can really move you, they're still not that, the, the percentage is still not that high. What do you think? What do you think? I, un, un, unfortunately, I completely agree. And I've come to an age to understand why ages ago, the last teacher I was studying with, um, you know, when I'll tell him, oh, Kavakos is playing Bartok in Chicago and, 
and there's cheap plane tickets. And, you know, as a student, I was like so excited. Oh, look, for $60, I can fly to Chicago and hear Kavakos live and all this excitement. And of course, I'll run to the concert hall anytime I could hear legendary name. I kind of looked at, just like, listened to me with a straight face. Like I said, nothing. And I said, well, wouldn't you be excited? Don't you want to hear him just to see what he's doing? And he was like, my dear, I started with Oyster. <laughs> uh, barely anything ever counts. And, and, and very few people can really touch me and, and do the things that you're talking about. Yeah. I have a, I have a little story. Um, I mean, because when I go to hear, um, you know, a quartet or a quintet or an orchestra, um, at this point, since I've heard most of the repertoire, standard repertoire, you know, many, many times, if I hear like a, a, like a conductor or a soloist who has some incredible rapport in the group or with the orchestra, then I'm interested, but oftentimes I'm really not interested. Um, and I'll tell you a story, and this is, this is a, it's a sad story. Years ago, I was dating a girl in the Cleveland Orchestra. And we were quite close, you know? And we were playing a Mahler symphony and there was a moment that was so beautiful. It was in, in the Adagietto of Mahler V. And I looked over to my then girlfriend and I, you know, I, I made a, she smiled at me, we, we smiled at each other and we both knew, we, we shared that moment. The next day I was called into the office with the music director and the executive director. Frank, don't you ever do what you did on stage again. Oh and I, you know, this is a professional environment. And I, I stopped and I said, oh, this is so sad. If our stage has become that serious where you can't share the joy with your colleagues. And, you know, I felt, I felt that's the kind of group that it, as good as it is, it's a good group, but th there's not this rapport. And, and I said, this is pathetic. You should be ashamed of yourselves for telling me this. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't screw up my part. I wasn't even playing. Good, you know good what for I'm you. What was, what was their response? <laughs> no response. I walked out. You know, that was it. Well, uh, I'm you know, glad. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one other story. And this is the exact opposite. So when I was a student at Juilliard, um, I did not get into the Juilliard Orchestra because to do that, you had to practice. But I, I did audition for the American Symphony, which rehearsed at Carnegie Hall with Leopold Stokowski. You know that name? Anyone know the name? So I called uh, the office of the symphony and I said, I'd like to audition for Maestro Stokowski. Okay. I go to his... Uh, apartment which was on Central Park. It was on Fifth Avenue, which overlooked Central Park. He had this magnificent penthouse apartment, you know, with great artwork and just beautiful. And he asked me to play what I came prepared to play and I played about an hour for him. And he said, Frank, he says, I love your playing and your musician, your passion. Um, it just it's infectious, and I want you to be in our orchestra. So I said, fine. When do I start? He said, Monday. This was like <laughs> Thursday. He says, just show up to Carnegie Hall. Your music will be out on the stand. I show up to Carnegie Hall. It's very hard music, um, and I was not familiar with any of it. And so I got really nervous, and every time I had a solo, I'm like, I'm looking at him, and I'm looking scared. And he called me back to his room at the intermission. And he said, Frank, remember the way you played for me at my apartment? With total abandon and total commitment. He says, even if you play every wrong note, even if you don't know the part, play the way you played for me then. He says, because if you're worried about me being happy, you'll never be happy playing in an orchestra. Mm -hmm. Never. Someone who's a musician needs to do their thing. They need to make a statement. And if, if the conductor appreciates it, which I certainly will, you'll be a happy man.
but to play in a group where the conductor is looking for you to look at them all the time and please them. And he says, you'll, you'll be miserable. And actually a lot of my orchestral career was played for people who were like that. It's, it's weird to say now, but there were enough people who let me go and let me do my thing. Most of them did. But Stokowski said it the way I think it was true for me. If, if you're in an orchestra and you can't feel that you can do what you need to do and, and make, make phrases like you want to make, it doesn't matter how great anything is, it's empty. And I, I, I talked to a bunch of clarinetists the other day on a chat. And I said, you need to find a way, even in the confines of your chair in an orchestra, or wherever you are, to be who you are and have your message and deliver it. And I told the, the, the uh, Stokowski story. Because for me, without having my outlet and, and giving my message to the audience, we lost a lot of meaning. Anyway, I hope that these few stories resonate a little bit. Oh, a lot. I mean, we really went over time, but if you somebody has a quick question, um, Gary, did you have a question? I, I saw hand earlier. I'm not sure if you have a still question. Gada, one second, wait, you're muted, so I cannot hear a word. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Wait, try it again, Gada. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, my, I'm, I'm working. Okay. I just want to say that I think it's wonderful to see how, you know, they have these coaches in football where they get the people like, exercise to do the right thing. This that cost these people who helped you, it was wonderful to let that that they let you do your own thing. That's so important. That, you know, that, that they understand you and, and take away the rigid rigidness that you could have rigidity in, in music that's awful. And uh, I'm I'm impressed with that. That that's nice of you to say that. Actually I have one little mother story. When my, so I was not good in school. My mom would be called in because if I didn't do well, I would usually misbehave and be funny. You know, that's what I did. And, and I made the teachers look silly. So my mom would be called into the principal's office. The principal would say, Mrs. Cohen, your son is not doing his work. He's a troublemaker. And she looked at me and she said, you know what? You just don't understand Frank. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what you're saying. If if I met someone who let me do my thing and appreciated it, it was all cool, as they say. Thank you, Frank. Frank, I, I am grateful you joined us this afternoon. I want to encourage you all. So Frank uh, is the artistic director of Cleveland Chamber Fest, which is in Cleveland. Chamber Fest, Cleveland. Chamber Fest, sorry. Chamber Fest, Cleveland. I will. Can I just put in a plug? Absolutely, go ahead. <laughs> Guys, write it down, chamberfestcleveland.com. If you go to our website, we have an upcoming festival of some of the world's greatest chamber artists uh, that will be held on the radio, mostly. And you, can, and you also have our YouTube channel. You can watch all the videos you want of some incredible musicians. So please do it. Go That's ahead. It, sorry, I, I'm sorry, I, I have to, I'm dying for a quick question since you said, so is your summer edition still happening and how is the situation with attendance up there? No, no, it's going to happen on radio. So it's going to be a virtual festival. Okay. We'll have chat set before the two hour radio concert, uh, but it, we, we're now taking archival material and presenting the two hour concert. Um, and if you go to WCLV, dot org or chamberfestcleveland.com it's all there and you'll be able to um, access these concerts if you want to definitely any way that we can support you let us know <laughs> uh just you know like what you see and share it right on facebook or any other social media that you might use and I, I can't wait actually someday to come down there and see you all again because it is my, was my pleasure when I visited. We had that concert in Atlanta with Michael. Um, and maybe I'll come with my family or 
you can do some duo pianos with Roman next time. We'll make it happen. <laughs> thank you for sharing this time with me. It was really, really wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. And enjoy your evening. <laughs> okay. Have a nice thank glass you. of water. Bravo. <laughs> thank you, Frank. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Frank. See you again. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.